case, not as much as we assume it to be. Uh, majority of the times, the reason the Chinese are not willing to take this seriously, even the threat of sanctions from the U.S. and the EU, is because U.S. and EU rely on China for their economic base. Um, majority of the time, the supply chains run back to China. So even if you were to threaten China on fixing its attitude towards Hong Kong, uh, when you buy majority of your stuff from China, you really don't have the kind of leverage that you would have uh, in order for those sanctions to work out. And that's why I personally believe it's not a useful tactic. It only goes on to hurt um, what the pro-democracy demonstrators in Hong Kong have been trying to do uh, and trying to explain that this is an indigenous movement. This is for the people of Hong Kong. And that's actually been hurt by external pressure in this case. Right. It's, it does seem to have backfired in, in that case, as well as what they could worry about now, the resignations themselves backfiring. Is, is the opposition actually handing, handing Beijing what it wanted and that they can now be slowly replaced by pro-Beijing lawmakers? There, there are two sides to that story. Uh, the interesting side is if they had not resigned and they would have been part of this rubber stamp legislative session, it would have looked bad. People in Hong Kong would have been further frustrated with the pro-democracy movement about the fact that they're not able to do anything in the Legislative Council. On the other hand, when they walk out of the Legislative Council, they're ceding space to pro-Beijing legislators who will either win elections or will simply be appointed by Beijing. Either way, it's a difficult spot to be in. They took a moral high ground from their perspective. The pro-democracy movement believes that they cannot have a genuine impact uh, at the legislative level. Why stay there? Why not just simply walk out of there, especially when Beijing is going to directly get involved and suspend or simply fire legislators who they believe are in violation of the national security law? So, you know, Beijing effectively continues uh, to win this battle. And, I mean, the world, the international community is, is really quite exhausted right now dealing with their own problems, economic crises, the pandemic. Uh, and the U.K., you know, will continue to remind China of the joint declaration that they signed at the handover. It was supposed to be enforced for 50 years. But again, does that even have any value today? Honestly, no. Uh, it, it goes back to the same issue. What the British and the Chinese signed at the time of the handover was this understanding that once and for all, Hong Kong is going to be a part of one country, that is China, but run under a two separate system. Mainland China will be run completely differently. Hong Kong would be run differently. That was the commitment. At any point of time, that was not the law. This is what we need to understand. That was an agreement. That agreement did not have binding value on China in the future. It was assumed it would be followed for 50 years. At no point is there anything punitive as part of that agreement that says, if China doesn't come through for 50 years under this agreement, that the UK has any authority to do anything. That means, essentially, even if they wanted to enforce that agreement, it's next to impossible to enforce that agreement to begin with when it was written out. For China, though, this was an internal matter. What China wanted to do from day one was to show the world that, listen, when we make a commitment like this is one country and two systems, we're going to run it completely separately. This is going to be a completely different way to look at China and how we operate. And in the long run, it was supposed to attract Taiwan into coming back into the fold that, listen, Look at how well we're doing in Hong Kong. They have everything they wanted. And if Taiwan were to walk back to China, we would be in a situation to offer you a similar deal and have the complete China, according to the Chinese Communist Party, in place. That has kind of gone off the rails. Right. For China, this has not been without some sort of a backlash. The backlash that they've taken is they've further alienated Taiwan and the pro uh, unification faction in Taiwan. And that was precisely my next question, because China's ambitions are broader as per the one China policy. Uh, and then where does this leave Taiwan? Because though Taiwan can now say, look, look at the example you set for Hong Kong, you can't maintain this, this policy. It's not compatible with China's uh, one party system. Uh, but if they do put, if the Chinese continue to put pressure on Taiwan, are we looking at potentially a military confrontation in which no one is really going to be willing to go to war with China in order to protect 
Taiwan's interest, even if their ideals are ideologically aligned like the United States, who would be willing to fight that battle if it were to get there? No one. Um, one of the biggest things is we, we keep having this assumption um, that if Taiwan and China were to go to war and if China were to invade Taiwan, somebody would come save them. No one will. And that's a fact of life. And no matter how hard we try to build this narrative that somehow the U.S. would jump in, somehow other powers would jump in, uh, that will not happen because the amount of time it would take the Chinese military to take over the island of Taiwan is under 24 hours. And if it is under 24 hours, there is no reaction time. There's absolutely no reaction time. And there is no way U.S. gets dragged into a war with a country like China purely based on the fact that, like I said earlier, majority of the U.S. supply chain is based in China. If China cuts off its exports to the U.S., U.S. doesn't have the home base industrial advantage it used to 45 years ago. So U.S. is staring at an economic downturn if China were to cut off its exports. Secondly, for China, this is a serious problem. The idea was if they could do well in Hong Kong, Taiwan would fall into place. And Taiwanese, specifically the DPP under President Tsai, has been very clear about the fact that, listen, we've been telling you from day one, this is what they do. This is how they come after you. Initially, they agree with you, and then they'll come after you, and they'll go for the jugular and completely wreck the system. Look at what they've done in Hong Kong. Look at what they've done in Macau. We're not going to let this happen to Taiwan. So in a lot of ways, Beijing has only helped Taipei's argument in the long run. And one thing is clear, no matter what happens, Taiwan is essentially surviving on norms and decency uh, and expecting China to kind of not walk into a conflict purely because it's economically unviable. Right. Okay. Adnan Rasul, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much, really, for, for taking the time to enlighten us with your analysis. We appreciate it.